everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I'm your host, Pierce Redman. So today we have a very special guest all the way from South Texas. His name is Guillermo Jimenez. He is the founder and editor of TracesOfReality.com, uh, where he has articles uh, and he does a podcast called Traces of Reality Radio. And he is also the host of uh, Demanufacturing Consent on Boiling Frogs Post. Guillermo, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show, Pierce. Absolutely. Um, so, Guillermo, why don't you... Uh, today we're going to be talking about the drug war, and this is something that you um, you know, are talking a lot about on your show, and it features very prominently mm-hmm. in a lot of your work. So why don't you briefly tell the listeners uh, your interest in the drug war, why this is so important to you? Well, as you mentioned, you know, I'm from South Texas, and so I guess by virtue of my geography, it became an issue that just was uh, important uh, inherently to me. Um, I happen to live right along the border of the United States and Mexico in a town called Laredo, Texas. So uh, just across the Rio Grande River is Nuevo Laredo, uh, Mexico, the home of Los Setas drug cartel. And so literally uh, two, three miles down the road from where I'm sitting right now is where you'll find uh, the scene of those bodies that have been found uh, disemboweled and hung from bridges and uh, bloggers and people who were uh, reporting on the drug war, uh, their bodies were found on, on that bridge. And it was at that point really that, that it struck me. Um, this was about a year or two ago. And it struck me because the, the public here in this town, in, in Laredo, have become so accustomed to this level of violence and, and to the, the reportage of it that they they hardly bat an eye mm. to to that kind of brutality uh, these days. And so I, I took a great interest in that from a psychological perspective, from a sociological perspective. And then I, I wanted to learn more about the drug war itself uh, on a global scale, on a local scale, uh, the, the major players, how it really works. And uh, I've come to you know, interview a, a number of different people and, and learn a great deal in the last year about the drug war. And so, uh, as you mentioned, yeah, I do talk about it quite a bit on on both of my podcasts and on the, the website. It's become something that I think, uh, you know, as I've said before, if you look at the, the, the globe, global political uh, landscape, if you really want to know what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak, uh, the knowledge of the global drug trade and and the so-called war on drugs, I think, is essential. I, it, through my research, I found it to be at the center of this very, very tangled web of, <laughs> of geopolitics. <laughs> oh, a- absolutely. I think people don't understand the how the magnitude of the drug war right now, how it is mm. linked to every single aspect of of uh, our you know of our laws, the border, immigration, right. uh, spying on people. It's become so much a part of the American state, uh, you know, as it is right now. So maybe you could um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the the reality of the drug war as you see it on the border, because I think a lot of people um, have some sort of a concept of the drug war. Uh, you know, they see it. You know, if you live in a big urban city like I do, you definitely see it. You know, drug dealing on streets and things like that. But I think people have a they're, they're not totally aware of the reality of the border and you know mexico is so close to us and you see this firsthand and uh you know you've been talking a lot on your show about these constitution free zones the increased militarization of the police force and actual you know military uh forces there as well and immigration but i'd be curious to see you know to have you talk a little bit about these constitution free zones because ultimately you know they might say it's for this or that but in the mm-hmm. end, it is about drugs. It's about finding drugs. Indeed. And, and, and to my mind, in the end, it really it's about uh, a system of control. Uh, drugs are really just the, the, the pretense. But you're absolutely right to, to point out that this is something that I've tried to point out to people on, on the program in the past is that those of us who care about civil liberties and the loss of that liberty over time – Um, have to realize that before there was a war on terror, there was a war on drugs. And that really is the root of the current uh, militarization of not just the border, but uh, of the country as a whole, of local police departments uh, uh, militarizing their local police forces, uh, gaining all kinds of fancy police state gadgets, you know, (laughs) the LRAD weapons and so forth that we've Mm. all uh, come to, to know 
that's all because of the drug war. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, we've uh, the, the, these no-knock warrants, the SWAT teams. I mean, you can go on and on and list all the various ways that police forces uh, resemble more uh, resemble more military forces these days than than do police anymore. Oh, yeah. And and that and that's and that's because of the drug war. And so we see it everywhere. But I think you, you you're right to point out that. Uh, it is much more vivid, I think, along the border uh, within these so-called constitution-free zones. You have an area of the country, and this is really key, uh, 100 air miles from any border along the United States. The con- and, you know, I was going to say continental, but really it includes Alaska and Hawaii as well. Mm. Uh, any border within 100 air miles, so that includes not just the southern border with Mexico, the northern border with Canada, and the eastern and western coasts. Uh, you can draw a hundred, uh, you know, a line across the country, around the country of, of hundred air miles, and you find that it include it, it sort of that encompasses um, almost every major city <laughs> in the United States. It's yeah. it's something like 190 million people live within that zone. It's it's nuts. And that so, would be that would be New York, Los Angeles, exactly. any Chicago, maybe even any, exactly. any major Chicago. city. In Texas, that includes Houston, a big, big city. It includes, uh, well, Laredo, which is not so big, but it does include <laughs> uh, basically every major city in this country. And so um, the potential is there to see the, the the sort of checkpoints that we see along the southern border in uh, in other places, in, in major cities. And in fact, I've been reading reports lately of the same sort of checkpoints that exist uh, just north of where I live. Um, I, I've seen reports of them uh, up in Maine, up in uh, New York State, <laughs> and so they're they're everywhere now. And and but but yeah, when you when you look this sort of stuff up, uh, and you can I mean I the, the audience listening can can check this out on YouTube. I'm sure just like YouTube uh, checkpoint refusal videos, and you'll get a, a couple thousand hits, maybe maybe more. Uh, one of them is a video that I shot uh, a, a little over a year ago. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We'll definitely include that in the show notes for this. I think that was yeah. And so I just I just point that out to people just to, to have them realize that hey, this stuff exists. And there's I, it, it, I'm surprised still that there are people uh, in in the interior of the country that that see videos like that and are and are genuinely shocked and have no idea that these checkpoints even exist. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's important to kind of point that out and say, yeah, yeah, it's true. When, whenever you travel uh, in any direction from a border town, you answer questions from federal agents, you play this little game with them um, uh, and sort of audition for your freedom to be allowed <laughs> to, to proceed down the road. It's kind of nuts. But I mean, it's more than just that. I mean, checkpoints are, are one part of it, but it's also uh, just if you live in a city like Laredo, it's, it's very, very normal uh, to see FBI, DHS, ICE, uh, Border Patrol, just you know anywhere about the city, uh, it's very normal to have to answer questions when you travel. If you you know poll, <laughs> like uh, this happened in a local news story. I don't know if you saw this, Pierce, but there was a local news story that came out of Laredo that did a piece on that video I just mentioned, and uh, <laughs> and they polled like uh, a number of, of of students at uh, the local university. And every single one of them said, what is this guy doing? It's totally <laughs> normal. You're, you're supposed to just answer mm. questions when you travel. And, 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 and they're right. It is normal if you live on the border. It's, it's just completely accepted, which is remarkable to me. So I, I do like to kind of share that with uh, the audience that may not be familiar with to kind of get the message out. And and this is something that uh, has been going on for years. I mean, am I correct in that? It's not it's not a yeah. recent thing with these checkpoints. This has been a reality on the border for many many years. Yeah, exactly. That's a common misconception. I, I you know a couple of um, reports were done recently about the constitution free zones, and which I kind of took issue with only because you know I appreciate the the uh, the sort of uh, awareness of it growing, but. Uh, there were folks out there citing a, an article from 2008 saying, oh, this is when it all started, back in 2008 is when it all started. Uh, and that was really uh, not correct. What, the, what, what changed in 2008 was basically the Border Patrol updated their policy to include uh, electronics like laptops and cell phones and things like this, that uh, items that can be searched at the border, at the actual port of, port of entry and at these checkpoints. Uh, but but no, th- this is this stuff has existed since 1952-ish. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been going on for a long, long time. So if we've had several generations now uh, accustomed to this way of life, which is why most people think it's absolutely normal. 
Yeah, and it's so funny too. You know, there's in the alt media at least. There's always this: the police state is coming. The police state is coming. But if you if you live by the border, it's it's been there for decades, as you say. Yeah, this is already this is reality. It's not you know changing or going away. Yeah, exactly. It, it, like I said, that I think to, to to my mind, the checkpoints are the most vivid manifestation of the police state you can possibly see because you know i've I've said this before you, you we we read about things like uh you know the nsa scandals mm. or you know phone tapping uh things like this and and a lot of these things are sort of happening in the abstract they're happening out in the ether where you can't really see it and so you 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 you, you might say to yourself okay sure so my phone's being wiretapped but they're not doing it to your face right they're not <laughs> it's not happening in, like right in front of you but at a checkpoint the police state's right up in your face and it's it it, it it can be a startling uh, realization to anyone uh, who goes through that for the first time, I think. And maybe we could uh, expand a little bit on that, because ultimately these constitution-free zones are about people stopping and trying to find drugs on, on people. But as you've documented numerous times, most recently uh, an interview you did with Sele Castillo uh, talking about the CIA essentially you know, he was w- one of these people, the original, the OG whistleblower, as you put right. it, for Iran-Contra. <laughs> and he was helping to train these people, helping to bring in cocaine. And uh, a whistleblower who you've had on before, who I think people really need to focus on, Julia Davis, who was a, a customs official and worked for the DHS. And she told you on a, an episode of Traces of Reality how, you know, they were told expressly, you're going to let in the next, you know, for the next hour or so, no checks whatsoever. You're exactly. going to let all these these trucks in. So, it, you know, this this whole constitution free zone bullshit it, it is, you yeah. know, it, it's just so silly because obviously these drugs are getting in and the state plays a very integral role in allowing this to happen. Absolutely right. And that is absolutely key. Uh, to this story to understand it fully because you do hear that. You, that is the justification for the Constitution Free Zone, the justification for the checkpoints or the any sort of infringement on your civil liberties or uh, again, the militarization of local police departments. Of course, the, the 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 pretense is we need to fight this war on drugs and we need to stop the flow of drugs from coming into the country. Well, I mean, even from a really simplistic sort of perspective, we can see we can look at that and say, well, obviously it isn't working. If that's <laughs> actually if that's actually your goal, which we know it to be uh, not. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it is. It isn't working. There are more drugs now in the country than ever before. Uh, 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 prices have lowered. Potency has gone up. Uh, you would think if you know, <laughs> prohibition. If it were working, you would see the opposite. You would see less drugs. They would be more expensive, and they'd be mm. less potent. Well, the absolutely the opposite has occurred. So prohibition is not working. Uh, at least not in the way that they say it's supposed to be working. So I think it's working just uh, according to plan perfectly the yes. way it's in the way it's really supposed to be working. So so you're absolutely right. So Sala Castillo, among others, have pointed out that for for decades uh, we have known it's been documented the CIA has uh, sort of managed the global drug trade. Um, the most obvious example is Iran Contra uh, in the 80s, the Civil War in Nicaragua. The Contra is being funded by uh, the United States government, uh, there, and there was a, a steady flow of arms and drugs, mm. uh, you know, going back and forth. Drugs coming back into the United States. Uh, people can look up the name Freeway Ricky Ross and find out all about what was going on in in Los Angeles in the 80s, and so. Um, so yeah, Sel is an important uh, person to kind of uh, to share his story and to learn from. He was there on the ground and saw it firsthand. And uh, to, on the other side of that is, of course, the, the who you mentioned just now. Also, Julia Davis uh, explained that in fact uh, she was there and uh, was privy to. Uh, knowledge of those stand down orders, uh, uh, you know, supervisors on high who may not even have been on the scene there locally ordered uh, the local agents to stand down for half an hour, an hour at a time. And it's presumed that it was during those stand downs that that's when the trucks come through that, you know, they've been properly bribed to not inspect. So, I mean, just from top to bottom, the whole thing is a joke. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the whole thing is, is a, a giant facade. It's not what it appears to be, and if you study it, even uh, you know, give it even just a, a couple of minutes of yeah. of, cur- of cursory research, and you'll find that they're lying to you. They're they're lying to your face and laughing about it. 
Oh yeah, and this this whole control grid I find so fascinating. Just this idea of you know they create the drug trade by prohibiting drugs, but yeah, they're, they're simultaneously bringing them in. And at times I do wonder if is their ultimate goal to keep us all on drugs? Is that is you know they want to keep this money flowing? Uh, and mm-hmm. it, it is just a it's a shocking realization when you, when you start to break that down that this for, as you say from top to bottom from a low level drug dealer to you know the heads of uh, DHS or whatnot are all helping to continue this constant flow of cocaine heroin methamphetamine marijuana what have you and guns of course people now mm-hmm. everything is flowing in through there. Interesting take. I mean, there's something to that. Uh, there was, of course, all those uh, conspiracy theories yeah. in the ni- in the 90s that I, I learned from listening to uh, hip hop and rap music as a teenager yes, yeah. about, you know, oh, cocaine was brought into the black community to destabilize and to destroy uh, the, 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 the black uh, family unit. That was something that was expressed through through rap music. That's where I first heard about it. And I was like, yes. oh, come on, that's not true. Right. And you find out that it was yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. exactly what was going on there. Again, you can just Google free Ray Ricky Ross and find out all about it. And if you look at um, drug law, for example, I mean, it's it's I, I think it it's pretty obvious that it, that it, it disproportionately affects uh, uh, minority groups. Uh, if you look at the jail populations, if you look at uh, those who consume crack versus those who consume cocaine, and the penalties for 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 both. Uh, one on the one hand, you know, if, uh, a couple of grams of cocaine might get you a, a you know five years, where a, the same amount of crack will get you fifty. It's it's insane. Uh, so there's there's a lot to that, Pierce. I think, and mm. you know that's that's worthy of 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 its own sort of research and and discussion. But you might be right in thinking that there is some sort of social engineering aspect to this in 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 keeping that steady flow of these drugs coming i mean i, I think fundamentally this it's a, it's a profit uh yes, uh, based yes, yeah. motive but there's you know there's something to be gained from keeping the public uh in a daze <laughs> yeah and then i mean you you can just take the you know wall street these big global financial institutions i mean they essentially exist because of drug money if you were to yeah. if you were to legalize uh, cocaine or heroin, uh, you'd have Wachovia, uh, <laughs> HSBC, all of these big banks that are laundering money. They would collapse. They, they're, you know, the economy would fall apart if they didn't exist. So obviously, this is a concerted effort to continue to keep this illegal while at the same time bringing it in in massive quantities. Absolutely, and that's something that Salé Castillo has said repeatedly to me in interviews. That, in his opinion. Uh, it's a pessimistic one, but in his yeah. opinion, this drug war uh, can never end because there's just too much money at stake. And in his opinion, uh, what you just said, he's shared that with me many times, is that the banking system would collapse, the economies would collapse. He, certainly the economies of, of Latin America would collapse, yes. but he, ar- he argues that the economy of the United States would collapse. We wouldn't see all these uh, banks along the border popping up left and right we're supposed to be in a depression damn it what are all these banks doing opening along the border banks you'd never heard of small banks uh with names you'd never heard of opening up uh, within blocks of each other uh he, according to Sella, uh, he suspects that uh the drug cartels aren't are, aren't just laundering money uh they're outright buying some of these banks which i i really don't doubt given them given the amount of money that they have so um so yeah <laughs> So maybe we could uh, shift gears a little bit and sure. and talk uh, more geopolitics, and in particular Mexico, because um, many times when talking about the drug war, I think people forget that there is this massive, massive war in Mexico right now. You know, estimates now 100,000 dead, uh, increased militarization. You've got U.S. Special Forces, CIA running around doing things. So maybe we could talk a little bit about... Uh, the the situa- how we've arrived at this situation, and particularly uh, in the early 2000s when the, the government of Mexico switched from the pre-party, which had ruled Mexico, I believe, since the 30s, on and on, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. they called it the perfect little dictatorship, mm-hmm. and this switched over to the, the PAN party, which is a, sort of a center-right party. And in this, they, you know, they arrest El Chapo, who is the the head of the Sinaloa cartel, and then he mysteriously walks out of prison. 
And for all intensive purposes, we have Vicente Fox initiating this war on the cartels. But maybe you could tell the listeners, uh, you know, this is not quite how it seems in reality. Right. So, yeah, I think you, you've summed up the history quite well. And, um, you know, beginning in really in 2007, when you see the escalation of the drug war in Mexico under Calderon. And uh, I mean, it, it's it's been it's been uh, speculated, but with evidence uh, that the the Mexican government has for, for for a long time. And this is really isn't even speculation. There's documented evidence to, to, to show that. Uh, Mexican officials and, and high up in the government have been uh, in league with these cartels for 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 a very very long time. In fact, uh, Mr. Bill Conroy of Narco News, I, I quote him frequently just because I really like the way he he phrased it, and I I struggle to find a better way <laughs> to phrase it myself. Uh, the way he sees Mexico, uh, he he's told me repeatedly that you know there are no cartels. Sort of wipe that from your mind. That doesn't exist. What it what exists are uh, factions of the Mexican government itself vying for control. And so when you look at it that way, you, you see Mexico is divided into states, but they're not states in the ways that 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 you or I would sort of recognize states in the United States. They're they're divided into states depending on which cartel controls that territory. I mean, it is it is a narco state. Mexico is at this point. It is completely run uh, by by drug money, and you know, it's it's. I mean, just recently, you can. I'll, I'll point your listeners to an article that I actually just came across uh, yesterday, and I believe it just broke yesterday, November sixth, two thousand thirteen. It's this is out of the National Security Archive. Oh yes, I just, yeah, I yeah. Just, you, you see that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The San Fernando massacre. So. Um, and this is so it's what oddly enough, you know, it, 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 it in this article, it says that, you know, we have new evidence linking the setas to the Kaibilias, the Kaibilas, uh, the elite Guatemalan special forces, the death squads in Guatemala. And I saw, I forget that that's not really common knowledge. Yes. You know, I talk about that so often and I guess I'm so insulated in, in talking to people who sort of speak on these issues that I forget that that's still classified. That's not really out in the open yet. But, and these but, were people we trained, correct? Exa- exactly, yeah. This was a U.S. trained special forces going back again to Iran-Contra in Guatemala. This is where the, the La Setas come out of our, uh, these trained uh, killers that the U.S. helped to train. <laughs> Uh, out of the out of the Kaibilas, those are Losetas. Also, uh, they were all were also recruited out of uh, the Gafe, which was Mexican special forces, also trained by the United States. Um, so that's where the Setas come from, and so I mean that's a really a, a, the most I think again vivid link to the connections to the U.S. government. But there has long since been connections to the the Mexican government. In fact, going back to the '80s. If you look at Mexico's, I think it was called the Federal Security Agency, only you have to translate that into Spanish to find, to actually look it up. Uh, but it was the Federal Security Agency was suspected, the DEA suspected the federal, that, that agency of being basically a front for the CIA. Um, and it turns out that's exactly what it was. The, the head of that agency was, a, was an asset of the CIA. Uh, they were working with, at the time in the 80s, with the Guadalajara cartel. This is the this is uh, the main uh, cartel, right? The main one. They were the top dogs. They were like this is the three. There was three guys basically. It was uh, uh, Quintero, uh, Fonseca, and Gallardo. And the, these three guys basically ran Mexico. They were also happened to be the point men for uh, Pablo Escobar in Colombia. So they were they were the ones bringing in the cocaine directly from the Medellin cartel. So these guys were like top of the heap, top dog, you know, uh, 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 drug lords, right? But they got sloppy. <clears throat> they actually they, they they found out that a DEA agent by the name of Enrique Kike Camarena uh, was on to their their case, was putting the links together, was starting to see connections between them, Mexico's federal security agency, and by extension the CIA. And so they took him out. They they flat out murdered the guy brutally, uh, brutally tortured him, uh, killed him, and uh, as a result. Uh, that was their downfall, and so that cartel collapsed, and out of the Guadalajara ca- uh, cartel, uh, it was split up into territories, and that's where you get the modern-day cartels. That's where that's where you get Cartel del Golfo, the Gulf Cartel, Sinaloa Cartel, Juarez Cartel, and La then familia. out of 
uh, Michoacan, uh, the, the, the uh, Beltran Leva, all, the, all that stuff comes out of the Guadalajara cartel. Maybe we could we could talk about this this consolidation though of the trade by the Sinaloa cartel. Yeah, and because I think that this is a really this is a fascinating new development in Mexico that again kind of you know flies under the radar of a lot of people. But that this whole drug war that uh, Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderon started was you know we were oh we're going to fight all of these cartels, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know in reality. Uh, there is evidence to point to the idea that they had made some sort of deal with El Chapo and Sinaloa, and that right. essentially they were going after Los Zetas, the Gulf Cartel, uh, Beltran uh, Leva, which you which you uh, mentioned before, which was uh, a, um, they were aligned at one point with the Sinaloa Cartel. Is that right? Uh, exactly, exactly. And uh, El Chapo is an interesting character, man. Uh, that's an interesting story in and of itself, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to read An- Annabelle Hernandez's new book, Narcoland. Yes, but yeah. I, I need I need to get my hands on that because I know she she details the rise of this guy coming from nothing. Yes, I mean, yeah. just coming from the yeah, and and that's a really interesting story in and of itself to me. But his escape is also interesting, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, he was whisked away uh, in. Uh, I, I believe he was put into some kind of a, like official government uniform yes, uh, yes. with the with the assistance of uh, officials who were in on the take uh, somehow and and he that's the way he escaped prison uh, but yeah there's plenty of evidence to suggest the fact that when when Mexico goes out uh, you know when when their forces go out and and, and they and they target uh, these cartels uh, they only seem to be fighting one side of it Sinaloa always seems to kind of escape unscathed uh, and there have been, you know, direct accusations by uh, what's his name? I think his last name was Zambada, uh, who was he was on, on, in trial in Chicago, uh, who was a part of the Sinaloa cartel, and uh, he outright said this is this is back when when Fast and Furious was in the news, right? When it was like yeah, okay. sort of like peaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he sort of just outright said that yeah, not, not that wasn't an accident. I mean, yeah, they were purposely they're funding us. We're we're getting arms, we're getting uh, weapons and money. Uh, from the U.S. government, that's that's what we're doing, <laughs> and so uh, that's been put forth. And there's evidence to suggest that that is very true. That there are efforts being made to con- sort of consolidate power and consolidate uh, into one giant. Uh, the way Ben Swan put it was one giant super cartel mm. in the form of of, of Sinaloa. Uh, which I mean, again, there's evidence to support that. Um, I I I I'm I'm persuaded by that, but on on, on the other side of that, I, I also see. The points that someone like a Douglas Valentine has put out there, um, I, I interviewed him not too long ago for uh, one of those chats on, on Boiling Frog's post, and he wrote a book on the Phoenix program, and basically he described the ways that this sort of CIA template, this blueprint for destabilization and, and control uh, began in Vietnam, and how that sort of transitioned into Central America during Iran-Contra and all that stuff. Uh, and those death squads and how that – it was called the Phoenix Program then. It was called the Salvadorian Option in Central America. And that sort of just transitioned right into Iraq also, mm. same sort of blueprint. But the way he described it to me, and it made sense, was really it's just a, a, a plan to destabilize – and to corrupt the local government of whatever country becomes the the target for for the United States, and so in the case of Mexico, uh, they've been thoroughly corrupted, thoroughly destabilized to the point where they rely entirely on the United States. They're kept, you know, right under that imperialistic thumb, and that sort of, if you look at it for, again from a sort of geopolitical perspective, that makes sense because that's the sort of the same sort of template that we see now. Uh, again, in, in a, we saw it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Iraq, uh, we're seeing it now uh, in the Caucasus. You see it all over the place, the same, the same template. Uh, and again, as, as we sort of op- we open the show this way, but just to go back to that point that if you, if, w- if you look at that and you look at the center of what's happening, the drug trade plays a, a key role uh, always. And um, that's how that they fund. I, that's how they fund the exactly. CIA. That's how they fund these these covert wars. Uh, Black op. Yeah, yeah. Sabelle so Edmonds has, has right, repeatedly exactly. talked about NATO. Essentially, is funded by heroin. Exactly. <laughs> that that's yeah. how they that's how they get by. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think that's what happened to Mexico. That's I think that's what's going on with Mexico now. Um, I think that perhaps for. 
maybe not political reasons, but perhaps because Sinaloa is the best funded at the moment, they're able to to buy most of these uh, officials and politicians, and perhaps that's why they've become the favorite cartel. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know if it's for any any other reason besides that, besides money. I, I can't think of maybe any... Uh, I haven't read anything anyway about any sort of political reasons why uh, Chapa would be favored over anybody else. I, I see it more as just the, they have the funds and the the infrastructure to be that super cartel. Yeah. Oh, I, I I was listening to an interview with Annabelle Hernandez, and she describes El Chapo as a nobody. You know, he's yeah. like nothing. He he mm. can barely read and write. He left school when he was like seven years old. Right. Uh, and he's really, you know, he's just one man. That's just, you know, exactly. They're well funded, so they they you know they'll go with him. And I think mm. that a lot of the, these uh, cartel wars are cyclical. You know, we'll, you'll like Escobar sort of asserting, yes, the Medellin cartel, we are going to be the most powerful and the infighting. But then eventually, you know, you get these other ones that are going to pop up again at some point. You know, there's always there's so much money to be made. Uh, it's impossible to think that yeah. Sinaloa will somehow completely Absolutely. take, you know, take over. And we see this happening now. You know, nature does not like a vacuum. So if you <laughs> topple, if you topple one head, like we've seen right now with Z40, uh, the, the the leader of Los Zetas was captured. The leader of the Gulf Cartel X20 was captured. Well, what's going to happen? Clearly, there's going to be infighting uh, to sort of take that position. And 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 what happens as a result of that? Well, more violence. Uh, so it, it comes as no surprise that we've seen uh, just recently um, uh, an escalation in violence in Mexico in those territories because there are people vying for that spot. So that's just what's going to happen. So that I mean to your point of the cyclical nature of it. I think that's absolutely true. What, uh, Guillermo, what is your take on this uh switch from the pan party to the pre party because as i as i view it i see it as sort of a you know the 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 drug war became so closely associated with calderon and his government and yeah. there there was a lot of reporting about you know all of these cabinet officials that he you know under his party and their connections with various drug drug cartels but how do you view this sort of switch to the pre party which as you said before i mean for decades was supporting all of these these cartels yeah and this is the thing i, I, I honestly it's to my mind i don't really see much of a difference i mm. i i've seen the same sort of I mean, it's kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats yes. in this country at this point. You know what I mean? It's not really – they're both uh, parties are corruptible, uh, and both parties ha- have been corrupted. Um, I guess it's because th- the the pre-party has such a long history of being linked to the drug war and to uh, drug money and the cartels because they were in power for so long. Um, that Then that's why they have that sort of association uh, with it, but the, yeah, you're right. There was a lot of talk that once the pre came back into power with this guy uh, Peña Nieto, that we were going to see a return to the old days of Mexico, where you know we would see business as usual, basically, uh, but with less violence. They would we, we would we would see the uh, the the sort of uh, drug war de-escalate um, and go back to the way things were because you know, there's always been this. There's all oh, there have always been as we just illustrated, you know, going back to at least the 80s. Uh, it's always been this way, but there wasn't this uh, same level of violence then. There weren't the sort of kidnappings and the beheadings and all kinds of crazy madness that we see these days. That didn't happen in Mexico uh, t- even 10, 15 years ago. That really started uh, with the modern day drug war, uh, again, escalating in 2007. And then when the setas broke off from the Gulf Cartel, that's when you really started to see, you know, just I mean, just all kinds of uh, of, of just crazy violence. Um, and so I guess there was that. There, there, there. I did hear some of that from from uh, from some of the the, the, the things that I follow uh, media in Mexico that there was an expectation of a return to to the old days in Mexico under the pre, uh, maybe some kind of uh, uh, alliance made. Uh, which there probably is with Chapo to to go after the the rival drug cartels and basically exterminate them and go back to the way things used to be. But um, that but doesn't yeah, really a, seem to be the case, though. I mean, it's no, not it as if violence has stopped. I mean, it's it hasn't, still it hasn't at all. It's yeah. still escalating. Absolutely. 
What what do you have any take on this? Sele Castillo in 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 the interview you just did on demanufacturing consent, which everyone should go and listen to. Uh, he he mentioned this this you know that the U.S. owns Mexico. That that Mexico doesn't really do anything without the U.S. say so. So you know is. Is this 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 whole war on the cartels? Do you do you think there's any credence to the idea that the U.S. wanted to initiate this? That this is part of a grand scheme to completely destabilize the country and essentially create this massive narco state? It's possible. It's hard. To, it's hard. To, I mean, that'd be speculation on our yeah. part. But it, but but it, it, I think it's possible. Um, there's certain like again, there's there's evidence to support that theory given given this country's history with through the CIA as as we just mentioned a short while ago, uh, and what happened in Vietnam, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Central America. Um, it would seem that the same is playing out in Mexico, the same sort of template. Um, but I mean, I couldn't say with 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 yeah. certainty that that's exactly what's happening. But I, I think it's it's you know it's very very possible. Um, for example, you know, just to, to Silas' point about Mexico just being completely under the thumb of the United States, I remember reading recently a report um, out of Narco News uh, and out of the Washington Post, which later was basically reporting what Narco News reported <laughs> without giving him any sort of citation of course, or any yes. kind of, Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there was uh, there's there have been uh, a mil, uh, you know Marines. I uh, basically uh, there have been special forces, U.S. special forces in Mexico. Uh, since at least then, since at least 2007, on the ground, you know, boots on the ground. Um, and the report out of the Washington Post, uh, I think it was Dana Priest that wrote this one, and I don't have it right in front of me, so I couldn't cite it uh, verbatim, but it was something to the effect that that um, within the last year, there were uh, plans in the works to send uh, more troops, and that uh, Mexico just now found out about it. In, in, in other right, words, yeah. the U.S. was doing this and putting boots on the ground, and, and the the Mexican government was only now just learning about it and and, and sort of giving the the okay retroactively. So just I mean again, it just goes to show how 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 you know how much control the U.S. government has over Mexico at this point. Uh, I think it's I think Sala's absolutely right to say that the U.S. owns Mexico. It doesn't do anything um, uh, without its its say so. Uh, there has been some pushback to that recently with Ara Peña Nieto, uh, whether it's just rhetoric and it's just him, uh, you know, putting on a public face versus what's happening behind closed doors. I, I, I couldn't say just yet. We'll have to wait to see how it plays out. But there has been strong rhetoric to the contrary, saying things like he wants the CIA basically out of his country. Uh, he wants to kind of run his own affairs. They have been pushing, uh, making efforts to kind of push them out of, of, this, of those meetings that they have about how to proceed with the drug war. So there, we have seen that rhetoric come from that administration recently. Uh, but again, we'll have to wait to see how it plays out to see if there's any truth to that or if, yeah. or if it is just rhetoric. And he's been pushing back on this whole NSA spying uh, yeah. scandal because apparently we've been tapping... Uh, Enrique Peña Nieto's phones since he's been in office. And I couldn't mm -hmm. tell at first, you know, is this like really like he didn't know that they were doing that? Or, or perhaps this that he didn't know, as you say. I mean, because we're sending troops there, we don't even tell Mexico. So I was, <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe he didn't know. Maybe this really is a, a, you know, I don't think he's really independent of at least the the cartels to some degree. But I, I do wonder, you know, is there a, a serious pushback here with the United States and Mexico? I think there could be, but again, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But um, it, that is that was curious, though. It, it, it is, you know, I wonder also whether or not he actually knew. Um, I have, I mean, I, I think he probably didn't, um, only because I sort of base it on the things that sort of like the, what 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 Rice, Russ Tice had said in the past, basically, of the NSA acting in a completely rogue faction, mm. uh, fashion. Where perhaps not even maybe maybe not even Obama himself knew right. that they were they were wiretapping uh, Mexico and wiretapping uh, Germany uh, or, or France or, or Brazil or any the number whole of world. other countries. exactly. So uh, I guess there's a there's a chance that he actually didn't know and those uh, other leaders uh, didn't know uh, if, if if what Russ Ties uh, says is to be believed that that the NSA has uh, has gone rogue has gone you know Hoover esque in their tactics of like. You know, well, hoovering up all, everything, all yeah. the in, yeah, everything exactly. So there's a, there's a chance that they didn't know. 
Uh, well, before before we end this, I would like to maybe try and end this on a somewhat positive note. And uh, just if we could maybe briefly talk about some of the solutions, at least here, uh, in combating the drug war. And in particular, this uh, notion of nullification, which I think is really interesting and is a, a very grassroots sort of hands-on approach to this. And just to get your, you know, quickly your thoughts on the nullification movement, as we've seen in Colorado and in Washington as well. I think that actually is the best way to approach this. And I think nullification is the best way to approach uh, many of the sort of issues that we want to tackle on a local front. Um, just recently also, you, you probably caught this uh, as well, but in, uh, in elections just a couple days ago, uh, Portland, Maine uh, legalized marijuana in oh. their city. Uh, three cities in Michigan – uh, also legalized marijuana. So we see this trend continuing, this sort of uh, nullification. They're not calling it a nullification. Yeah. <laughs> they, may, they may not even know what that means exactly, but that's exactly what's happening in effect. They are, they are in effect nullifying the federal law by passing these local uh, ordinances. Um, and I, I do see this trend continuing. And I've, I've talked to friends about this, and we, we uh, differ often on whether or not this is a good thing. I happen to think it's a good thing. Uh, there is an alt, there's an all a sort of a, a competing uh, theory or way of thinking. Um, whereas you know, if we we see this uh, this the sort of federal government uh, or local state governments begin to regulate and to uh, tax marijuana, for example, there is uh, a concern out there among uh, libertarians or among uh, mm. people who consider themselves to be uh, you know f- you know free thinking or you know want to live outside the state, for example, or something like that. Uh, there is that concern that uh, regulation and taxation may not be the best sort of alternative. Uh, for example, there were concerns initially when when medical marijuana was passed in California and now in, in I think twenty other states at this point. Um, that concern of being and yet. Uh, another database <laughs> having yeah. to go and sign up and register for that card means you're going to have to be put into a database of a of a known uh, marijuana user. Now you might say, well, what's the harm in that? What, what, you know, so what? Okay, I get to get my, I get my little, you know, uh, you know, free pass to, to smoke up with my little <laughs> marijuana card. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Well, you know, it, it can, you know, we, we think of it this way. I think of it this way. And this is a conversation I was having just uh, just yesterday, actually, which is still why it's fresh on my mind, this sort of the debate, is that I guess there's a potential for uh, perhaps the DEA or the NSA and uh, more probably more the DEA looking at a, a database like that, right, and data mining it. Uh, and uh, under the assumption that if you are a marijuana user, then perhaps you are more likely to be a cocaine user mm-hmm. or a heroin user or just a someone who would or just break the law in general. So they might they might uh, single you out by being on that database. They might single you out and investigate you further for other sorts of crimes. And I guess there's a potential for that uh, that exists. Uh, but I, I I think I really got off subject from your original question. No, no, I mean, no, no, I mean, that, that is perfect, because I, I kind of go back and forth with the, the I, I really do like the, the concept of nullification, I think that it is a, a great peaceful way to go about things, but I, I do flip back and forth, especially when, you know, lately in the media, we've got all of these, you know, like Sanjay Gupta, and, mm. you know, Kofi Annan, all of these kind of nefarious characters coming out in favor of marijuana legalization, and I do wonder, is there an agenda behind this is this they're sort of catching up with the times or is there something else and i just saw uh recently yesterday that in colorado this tax that they're having on mar- marijuana now where it's where it's become legalized is going to be a huge enormous yeah, tax it's like 15 and percent yeah, or it, yeah i mean crazy. way more that is not like taxing liquor or, or yeah. cigarettes or anything like that and all of that revenue is going – they're going to build some schools, but then the rest of it is going into law enforcement, right. which to me is just sort of backwards in, you know – Yes, perhaps police aren't going to be, you know, arresting you for drugs, but I mean, there's still a repressive force here in America. Uh, so right. it, it, it does kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I can't really tell how it is. And I think that that's sort of part of the, the problem is that the, you know, the, the war on drugs, the drug trade is so massive and huge that it's not, yeah. you can't really snap your fingers and everything is okay again. 
Yeah, no, and there is a real danger uh, to that, and that's a that's a legitimate concern, I think. And I, I struggle with this myself because you know what's the alternative? I mean, obviously, the current system obviously is 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 not a good one, mm. <laughs> and I, I wish not to live in uh, this sort of society where where drugs are uh, like marijuana specifically, but all drugs really, uh, prohibition in general, uh, where prohibition exists. Uh, just from a fundamental, from a liberty sort of perspective, um, that's where I come at it. There, there are so many different reasons to be against prohibition, but to my mind, fundamentally, it is a liberty issue. It is a question of whether or not some entity uh, like the state has the authority over you, the sovereign individual, to tell you what you cannot and cannot do with your own body. It comes down to that for me. However, um, I don't know that the current uh, method that we're sort of uh, going down, the sort of road we're going down, is the best one. Um, there, there may be a better one that we haven't quite uh, thought of yet. But I will say this, though. if uh, It shouldn't end with marijuana legalization. We should – those people who are sort of advocating for, for legalization of marijuana, I really hope that once that happens, because I think it will – um, that they continue to push for an end to, uh, to prohibition completely, because the, I mean the, the drug war won't go away with just the legalization of marijuana. Uh, the militarized police won't go away. The, the the checkpoints won't go away. You know everything we talked about earlier. None of that will go away uh, unless we completely end prohibition, and I mean everything. But the problem with that is that most of the advocacy groups that we see today um, that are anti drug war. Are strictly pro marijuana. Yeah. There's no, there's no normal for cocaine. You <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? Right. Yeah, <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> you won't see that. That's not uh, PC yet. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I, you know, there are people working towards this. I mean, uh, uh, for example, Leap, uh, uh, law enforcement against prohibition. The guy I talked to not too long ago, Peter Christ. That's his main point, and that's I, I did uh, appreciate that from him is that he is against prohibition entirely. And he that's a point that he often often uh, stresses, is that we can't stop with just marijuana or nothing's going to change. So I hope, and <laughs> my hope mm. is that this trend does continue, but we don't see it stop with just marijuana. And that is my concern that I, 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 I think it might, given the current climate, yeah. I think it might, and I hope that it doesn't. I think it would just, it would take so, so long because it's only now that, that even talking about legalizing marijuana has become okay right. in in mainstream press so i it it very well might sort of end there and and then furthermore too if if you're taxing marijuana at 15 percent, no one's gonna buy it and then they're you know you're simply just going to allow for uh, a market to open up where you're gonna have cheap illegal marijuana so mm. i i'm not I'm, I'm sort of still on the fence about that as well but anyway, Guillermo, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and an honor as well. I've been a huge fan of your work. And uh, before we sign off, why don't you please tell the listeners where they can read more of your stuff and listen to your podcast as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you, Pierce, for having me on the show. I appreciate it very much and appreciate the kind words. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so folks can check out my website, tracesofreality.com. Uh, right now, I'm producing a weekly podcast called Traces of Reality Radio, which you guys can subscribe for uh, free via RSS feed or iTunes, or perhaps we'll add a couple other methods soon. But you can check out uh, everything that I do on that website. I also link from that site over to BoilingFrogsPost.com, where, as you mentioned earlier, I do a weekly podcast for Sabell Edmonds and the gang uh, called Demanufacturing Consent. So uh, both of those are available uh, demanufacturing consent, uh, uh, unfortunately, only if you are a BFP subscriber. Although you can, which listen to everyone it. should go out. And everyone and should subscribe be. <laughs> it's, it's the best fifty dollars you'll ever spend in a year. I I, I, I can attest agree. to that. Yeah, I think the, I think everything you know, everything that the website does. I'm really really excited to be part of the team. Mm. It's an honor to be part of the team because I, I've been a, a fan of their work for a very long time. Um, I'm sure your audience is well familiar with with BFP and absolutely. the good work that they do. So, uh, absolutely, want to echo what you said. So, do check out that podcast. And again, you can check out everything I do on the website tracesofreality.com. Guillermo, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure, uh, Pierce. Thank you again.